You're listening to the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast, a place for sex addicts to share their experiences of recovery, to help break the stigma, myths, and misconceptions of sex addiction. This podcast may contain topics of sexuality, sexual trauma, dysfunction, or other things that may be triggering. So listener discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast. My name is Jason, I'm a sex addict, and I will be your podcast host for today. Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome to episode number 70 of the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast. This week, I'm excited to be sharing a conversation that I had with Matt E. from the noon Zoom meetings. And although being relatively new to the program, Matt emailed me and offered to be a guest on the podcast after some hesitation. And I wanted to read just a part of his wonderful email. He wrote, I do think I might have something to offer in my own story as a Native American and the reality of intergenerational trauma and the persistent cycles of addiction, abuse, and violence that follows, and how these cycles remain unbroken in a lot of our families in my community, including my own, as well as coming to terms with some of the spiritual destruction and genocide and how that manifested in my disconnect with my own lack of a spiritual connection and prejudices I've had to let go of since working the program. I know it's been powerful in my own recovery seeing Native representation on the outside of this program, and I'm sure it's present inside this program too, of course, and even your podcasts. I just want to contribute to that if I can. Yeah, and I thought he would be absolutely perfect for the podcast. After we finished recording, Matt mentioned a reading from the Big Book of AA that helped him in coming to terms with his spirituality and letting go of old prejudices. And this comes from Bill's story on pages 13 and 14. And this is just a page after Bill had mentioned, There remained in me the vestiges of my old prejudice when he was talking about his friend finding God. And I've read that passage on another episode of the podcast. So turning to page 13, I was to test my thinking by the new God consciousness within. Common sense would thus become uncommon sense. I was to sit quietly when in doubt, asking only for direction and strength to meet my problems as he would have me. Never was I to pray for myself except as my request bore on my usefulness to others. Then only might I expect to receive, but that would be in great measure. My friend promised when these things were done, I would enter upon a new relationship with my Creator, that I would have the elements of a way of living which answered all my problems. Belief in the power of God, plus enough willingness, honesty, and humility to establish and maintain the order of things were the essential requirements. Simple but not easy, a price had to be paid. It meant destruction of self-centeredness. I must turn in all things to the Father of Light who presides over us all. Great reading, and in our conversation we did talk about the loss of a spiritual path from Matt's Native American roots. And thinking of that, I wanted to talk a little bit about my experience at the High Lung Ritual in San Francisco this past weekend, and I will definitely have more to say about that at the end of this episode. But yeah, during their opening, they had a few Native American women performing a smudging ceremony, and I'm not sure what nations they were from, but yeah, three women and a little girl was so, so adorable. Uh, But uh, for some background, smudging or other rites involving the burning of sacred herbs is a ceremony practiced by some indigenous peoples of the Americas. While it bears some resemblance to other ceremonies and rituals involving smoke from other world cultures, notably those that use smoke for spiritual cleansing or blessing, the purposes and particulars of the ceremonies and the substances used can vary widely among tribes, bands, and nations, and even more so among different world cultures. And it smelt to me like they were burning sage, and I also felt a sense of cumin uh, as well in there, so I'm not sure exactly the things that were burning, but it was so beautiful. They were using feathers and branches to cleanse the stage, and I know Kai swept some of the smoke onto us in the audience, 
and I was uh, pretty close to front row. Anyway, I did want to play a little bit of Highland's opening ceremony at the Warfield, and this is the call and response, and it also had some beautiful nature sounds in the background that played for about an hour before the band actually took the stage. So it was wonderful entering into the Warfield and just hearing these nature sounds. Remember that we all are brothers. Remember that we all are brothers. God, I am still riding a spiritual high from that performance, and more on that later at the end of this episode. Well, now I am ready to turn it over to my conversation with Matt, and here it is. I hope you enjoy it. Yeah, and I'm so glad that you reached out via email. When I first got the email, I thought it was going to be feedback for me to read on the podcast. It was pretty lengthy. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, this this sounds awesome. And then what I realized you were pivoting for being a guest on the podcast, I was like, oh, hell yeah, this would be awesome. Yeah, but I tossed and turned in my head for a bit before I made that decision. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm really grateful that you did. So, yeah, we have... Matt here on the podcast, and I know Matt from the Noon Groups. And Matt, you are here in the Bay Area, correct? No, I'm actually, oh. uh, I am like four hours north, uh, oh, northern wow. California. Yeah, okay. I, I'm in sort of the rural mountain area. Nice. Yeah. You've always mentioned Northern California and, and the Bay Area is part of Northern California, but I forget that there's places outside. Um, we have, I know we have meetings up in Redding and Ukiah and places way up and out there. So, you know, really glad that you found our meetings. Oh, dude, me too. Yeah, the noon Zoom is the best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. You've been kind of with the, the meetings for less than a year, a couple months. Oh, yeah. I've been in a, coming up in like four months in the program now. Um, really, when I got into the noon Zoom, that's like when my program really took a turn for the better. Um nice. That was like a couple months ago, I think a little over two months ago. Yeah. So um, you've listened to some a, a bunch of podcast episodes. And so, yeah, you know that uh, I usually go through what's in our uh, inner, middle and outer circle as kind of a way to get to know each other. And uh, are you comfortable with sharing that here on the podcast? Absolutely. And I'll just say real quick, this is like very surreal moment, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like listening so much and being here. Uh, yeah. So my inner circle is uh, pretty vague uh, on the surface level. It's a uh, pornography, uh, masturbation and engaging with sex workers online. Um, that includes escort sites, stuff like that. And um, yeah, as far as pornography, that includes, of course, just viewing it, collecting it, uh, piracy of pornography just sort of, sort of a general engagement with it. Um, mm -hmm. Masturbation, uh, abstinence from that, if that being a inner circle, that's um, right now I'm currently committing to a 60 to 90 day abstinence sort of as just like mm -hmm. a reset, as like a lot of people are familiar with in a program. And then, yeah, pretty self-explanatory, the engaging with sex workers online, escorts, that type of deal. Yeah, I know for the masturbation for me, I first started working with the sponsor after I had been in the program for... A year and a half so i think i had already done that sort of abstinence 
Um, but when I started working with the sponsor, he asked me to abstain from all sex completely. And, and by that time, a year and a half in the program, my wife and I were trying to reestablish our sexuality. And so that was out, but I did commit to 60 days of no masturbation. And I've mentioned it here on the podcast that I think I made it out to 84 days, just you know, kept going one day at a time. There are a few days in there where I felt kind of sketchy and just like, I'm ready to masturbate. No, I can't do it today. I'll do it tomorrow. And by then (laughs) when I got to tomorrow, the urge had gone away. So it was something that really helped me trick myself. (laughs) For sure. Yeah. How about uh, your other circles? Yeah. um, So my middle circle is like pretty long. Got a lot of stuff in there. There's a lot of non-sexual things I've added over Mm -hmm. my like progress in the program big trigger for me is uh, lack of sleep sleep deprivation so oh, staying yeah. up, up late and then there's things that coincide with uh my inner circle stuff like overeating uh social media addiction the big thing for me uh, mm-hmm. as well as like compulsive spending sort of just patterns of like avoidism like uh escapism i should say mm-hmm. and then uh yeah and then in middle circle um that's where i include Stuff like uh, specifically seeking out sexual content, watching like sexual TV shows, uh, mm-hmm. such as inappropriate, mm-hmm. excessive TV show watching. And um, just kind of, that's kind of like the surface level of it. I mean, I could go through a lot of them, but yeah, not necessary to, to add every single thing, but, you know, just a brief glimpse. Oh, I will say uh, also like isolation is huge. Oh, skipping, yeah. skipping meetings, you know, skipping the, my daily calls with the fellowship and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. How about outer circle? Yeah, my, I mean, my outer circle is kind of, it's pretty long too, but some big ones for me is uh, music, whether it's listening, creating, writing, recording. It's a big outer circle for me, as well as uh, reading, to read a lot, like, like I love authors like uh, Kurt Vonnegut, it's mm-hmm. like, uh, as well as just like a lot of self-help stuff and writing, like uh, writing, journaling. There's a huge exercise, even if it's just like getting on a walk or uh, w- weightlifting too. And mm-hmm. um, listening to podcasts like this one, it's got a huge list. I always d- tap into those. And then, yeah, just some more general outer circle, like step work, meetings, stuff that's going to help my program, meditation, and uh, all that stuff. It all sounds really good. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to develop it more because it, I there's more I left out, but it's, and I was like, dude, this is such a long, like, I'm good. I'm set. I got out of circle for days. Mm-hmm. And then, when I start getting abstinent and all of a sudden these hours, four to five hours of not watching porn are just free and open all of a sudden mm-hmm. those that outer, outer circle does start shrinking a bit when you, <laughs> mm-hmm. when it's like, so I am still trying to like develop that, add more yeah. to it. Yeah. In your email, one of, one of the concerns you had was that you had just joined the groups. So relatively new and didn't have a lot of long-term abstinence and you were kind of worried about coming here as a guest on the podcast with not a whole lot of sobriety. And for me, any sex addict story is valid. And so I think, by the way, I I live (laughs) next to a Harley dealership. So (laughs) occasionally I get some loud, loud vehicles uh, coming across, but yeah, anyway, you, you had mentioned the fact that talking about being relatively new to the program and, not having a lot of abstinence, at least from my perspective, it's an important thing that we share with the podcast community. So I was wondering if you could talk about that. Yeah, man. And like I had mentioned before, yeah, I was a bit nervous. I, I think I was listening to a podcast. I believe uh, it was the one with Matt uh, from mm-hmm. Arizona. And um, yeah, listening to him and just talking about like kind of the vulnerability, embodying that vulnerability and setting aside just like all the fear and the fears of like anonymity, stuff like that. And just mm-hmm. like that. And then like forming the connection in that. Cause I, I, like I said, man, I've listened to so much of this podcast through my own journey in SAA and listening back on this a uh, couple step ones in the podcast, like were huge for me. Mm-hmm. Just like, and it was just so 
admirable the vulnerability that they were taking and then talking about these things sharing our stories and our experiences like dismantling the shame and so much of the stigma around mm-hmm. sex addiction and everything that embodies it and then i just got the crazy idea i was like yo what if i what if i reached out what if i th- did that and at first it was kind of just like an intrusive thought and i was like oh no no i ain't <laughs> hell no hell no i ain't doing that. <laughs> and then i don't know man i kept of course i kept listening and a week later went i just i don't know i was like hey i'm just gonna do it you know mm-hmm. and um like i was afraid because i again i'm a newcomer i haven't had mm-hmm. a lot of abstinence i haven't had over a month of abstinence yet i really consider myself relatively like uh naive kind of still green for mm-hmm. like lack, mm-hmm. <laughs> pun not intended uh, yeah and uh but yeah and it, but i figured hey that's a perspective to offer too you know? yeah yeah completely valid yeah, we've had, uh, I can't remember, I think it was David H. Um, I'm not sure. Someone that was uh, in the meetings for about a week. And I had put out an invitation to be part of a, a panel. And he jumped right in. And so, yeah, I'm just starting out in this, this program. And so, yeah, any any level of amount of time we've been in the program and I mean, where we are in our sobriety, I don't care as long as uh, we're sharing our stories with the podcast community with the world. I think it's an important thing. It also, you know, like like you mentioned, it talking about this kind of stuff helps break the stigma of sex addiction and that, you know, we are just, you know, just regular people. Yeah. Before getting into your family of origin stuff, um, I am blanking. So yeah, why not pivot to that? Uh, you had mentioned being Native American and some generational trauma, and I was really, really intrigued by that in your email. And before getting to that, I think what I did want to mention was, have you been to a BIPOC meeting? You know, I just attended my first one today. Um, okay. N- not in our fellowship, though. I I had to go to another fellowship that's like centered around Buddhism and stuff. And- uh-huh. Um, I saw a BIPOC meeting and immediately uh, I was like, why not? I've been hesitant to join those meetings because mm-hmm. I am I am biracial and I'm pretty light skinned. Like I've, I had a brother mentioned before who's like, oh, I would not have guessed you. I, you're a native until I heard you step one. Mm-hmm. And uh, I got that. I get that a lot. But if it's crazy. If you look at a family picture, like I am the lightest skin one. Like my mom is everybody's around me stark. And uh mm-hmm. A lot of times I, I, I've been to like butt of jokes of that by like family members and stuff. Mm-hmm. It's just like, it, it's, it, that's kind of been my hesitation. And I, I just attended my first one and today, and it was huge. Like awesome. even just some of the introductions was amazing. Just like, even just introducing where you're calling from. And then it's like, at least the meeting I attended, as you introduce where you're calling from, you don't just say, I'm from Kentucky, this place, this city, mm-hmm. you say, uh, I'm from this territory of these, uh, and then you naming the tribal people. Yeah. yeah. And just like uh, otherwise known as uh, insert city name, Kentucky, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, whoa, what the hell? Like that's, dude, just especially as a native, like that's so amazing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, but yeah, I just, uh, that's cool. That's cool that you mentioned. I just checked my first one out. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There's uh, one that started. I think it started here in the Bay Area, but it's uh, a Zoom meeting. It's a Saturday morning meeting. I think it's at uh, 10 o'clock, but it is uh, specifically a BIPOC meeting that a lot of my friends do go to. And talking about the Native American culture, generational trauma, and the um, degradation of spirituality or things that you had mentioned in your email. And I was wondering if we could talk about that. Yeah, absolutely, man. So like a bit of background about myself. Uh, So I'm 24 now and I first discovered porn when I was like nine. I grew up in a really turbulent household and that's where a lot of the discussion around intergenerational trauma becomes relevant Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. for me and for a lot of people because I mean, originally this addiction was an escape from a lot of the pain and a lot of the uh, damage and trauma that was in my household. You know, when I first started coming to the meetings and started saying I am a sex addict and going through the process of my step one, I like really thinking like I just realized like how long I didn't consider myself a sex addict at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, (laughs) addiction runs through my family like 
it's rampantly, um, you know, whether that's substance addiction, food addiction, shopping addiction, it manifests in a lot of different ways. And like mm -hmm. me and my siblings, I mean, I grew up in a house of like 13 to 14 people. Oh, I have, wow. yeah, I have eight siblings. We all have our different manifestations of this, of this. And, uh, when I look back on my family tree, a lot of these cycles continue all the way up there. And I believe mm -hmm. it's like remnants of, uh, genocide and a lot of repression. And this concept of uh, intergenerational trauma, this reality is not exclusive just to Native Americans. I mean, it's apparent in uh, a lot of people. I mean, just going to these meetings and hearing just the patterns of sexual abuse, or sexual mm -hmm. trauma, or even not even such extreme examples. It's, I mean, yeah, it's not exclusive, but. Yeah, yeah, we hear a lot of, about adult children of alcoholics, ACA is, you know, something that is very common. And so a lot of us have had different levels of addictive personalities in our family of origin. So it doesn't necessarily need to be sex addict to sex addict, but different types of substances. And like you mentioned, you know, your siblings all kind of displaying different types of ways that they cope. I think we started uh, mentioning it earlier, the, the core hurts and behaviors, uh, those things are kind of the same in what we each do. And this is case in point with some of my best friends that I've grown up with have been alcoholics and drug addicts, and we all speak the same core language. And so we, we understand the, the, the root of it and how we choose to cope is completely different. But the things that are underneath the surface are the same. Yeah, absolutely, man. And just like, and coming into this program was huge in me recognizing that and realizing that just like, as far as all that pain that, uh, you know, I've, I know I've like buried that, that pain doesn't go away. That trauma, the turmoil, it, it's, <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah, it's there. And it's, uh, and I think that's huge, especially going back to like how it's passed down, but that was a huge thing coming into this program. Like, Dude, I just, I mean, I really came to this program because I wanted to stop acting out. I wanted to stop watching porn because mm -hmm. it was so destructive. And through the process of getting into this program, that's ripped a Band-Aid off and showed me like, oh, yeah, this is so much more than the surface level of my addiction, my vices, and what those that has manifested as. Yeah, so with what you had mentioned in, in the email, and we started, I, I had brought this up a little bit earlier was spirituality and the, the sense of spirituality loss that you've had. And I didn't fully understand everything that you were conveying in the email and was really, really curious about that. Yeah. So like at a certain point, like growing up, it was really uh, a bit confusing spiritually because mm -hmm. um, we grew up very traditional, a lot of uh, rituals that were passed down through my ancestors and uh, through our lineage and uh within our tribe and but at the same time we had a at a certain point i might have mentioned my mom struggled with alcoholism mm -hmm. uh at a certain point there was her in her own healing journey she became sober and she actually became saved and became a devout christian and then mm -hmm. that kind of introduced this whole new aspect to spirituality and religion into my life a lot of it was a lot of shame like prone to uh being used for a lot of uh shaming especially related to us and uh it was just what i would attribute to a bit of like a misunderstanding that kind of manifested in ways of just like using the bible on her I, her interpretations as justification for abuse phys specifically oh. physical abuse stuff like that and then just a uh, general sort of you're going to hell <laughs> like uh, yeah, you know, yeah stuff uh for like minuscule things for um but it was also really confusing because sometimes she did have relapses in the drinking and but meanwhile i was still hearing a lot of this stuff me and my siblings mm -hmm. so it's so confusing and then uh then came in another aspect where there was a total disregard and a shunning of that original traditional spiritual practices that we had Mm -hmm. And and that kind of tapered off here and there, but I mean, it's still stuck around for years now, you know, and I, that kind of paints a bigger picture to what I've learned more these past two years is I've like learned about my lineage and gone through therapy and uh, had things point out and brought out of me as far as just the whole reality of uh, intergenerational trauma and 
sort of the genocide and colonialism of that is mm -hmm. my tribe as my people we don't really have a, a bible we don't have a lot of stuff that was able to be passed down uh besides like word of mouth besides tradition and a yeah, lot of uh, yeah. rituals like that and so as a people we've lost a lot of sense of spirituality and i could say that as far as my family i mean i can't speak for a lot of other tribes i can't speak for uh, other indig indigenous people so i've had to come to terms with that and there was you know when i first started like and i knew a lot of this stuff as a kid i mean growing up we were educated and we were brought up by my parents and my family about mm -hmm. the reality of things since as far as uh what happened to our my ancestors and my grandfathers and you know, as I started learning about a lot of this, a lot of this and really understanding how this plays in my own picture and my family uh, system. And there's, a, I, I grew into like a really sharp, like pessimism and uh, cynicism against religion, especially yeah. organized religion, Christianity and the such. I, I could probably say for religion in general and spirituality, I hated it. And, you know, I think about like when I was a kid and a lot of the stuff I went through and a lot of just like the self-pity I felt, I hated God, whatever God was, whatever this creator was in my life that gave me what I, whatever it gave me, I, I hated it, whatever that, that concept might be. It took me a while to sort of let go of that cynicism and that all that negativity and that hatred that was like just being redirected uh, out of me. And that was a bit before the program. Um, mm -hmm. I will say probably, I definitely don't condone it. It's not for everybody, but psychedelics had play has played a huge part in my mm -hmm. sense of spirituality and sort of cracking that mold mentally and a lot of like my really kind of toxic patterns. I don't know, uh, around the age 18, 19, I had a, some pretty big experiences that really cracked that open and really showed me how much of that hate and like negativity I was harboring and how like closed minded I really was. Mm. And um, eventually I reached a standpoint where, as far as my beliefs, I tend to believe that every, I mean, it's pretty clear, like every religion, to me at least, to what every, all these different religions, these pathways, people are connecting with the God of their understanding. They're connecting with mm -hmm. some higher power, like it, as is referenced in the program. And that was like undeniable for me to see when I kind of like set my prejudices aside. Yeah. And, um, yeah. I mean, but coming into the program, it's been confusing. I'm on step two right now. So okay. I'm sort of figuring it out for myself. But I eventually ended up leading into a lot of more, a lot of more Eastern stuff like uh, Buddhism, mm -hmm. uh, Zen, Zen Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, nothing specific as far as like sex and lineages, just sort of like tiptoeing around those. And then coming back into connection with my own sense of spirituality and being able to carry these new traditions and this, uh, rituals and these ideas and the views, especially when it comes to like spirits and the, and the world and the higher power being like the life and the universe around me. That's it. Mm -hmm. I get it. That's a huge source for me. But yeah, that's been a bit of my own like uh, journey with that so far. And, yeah, uh, that's amazing. We don't need to delve into it too deeply, but uh, I was you know curious when you brought up psychedelics, if it was like anything like, like ayahuasca or DMT um, mushrooms. I know people have done specific therapies around that, that sort of stuff. Uh, I have no experience with that, but one of my good friends has just done some mushroom therapy uh, with his therapist and uh, it has been an eye opening experience for him. So I'm curious about what that was like for you. Yeah, man, dude, like, uh, I'm so happy to talk about it too. Cause it's, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's so cool, especially recently, like a lot of the stigma around that is being broken and yeah. So, yeah. so much. And now we're getting the research that it's like, you know, but it, of course it's not for everybody, but for me, I've dealt with a lot of suicidal, um, uh, mm -hmm. ideation and thoughts here and there throughout my life since I was a kid and, uh, psychedelics have saved my life on multiple occasions. Now, and here's where a lot of the issues can come in a lot through these experiences. I definitely wasn't getting the most out of it because there was, wasn't a lot of integration and that meaning I could have, I would have huge epiphanies. I would have these, a lot of healing, but a lot of times I would drop it then and there. Um, like uh, for an example, I mean, it was as far as like my sex addiction, it's surfaced. I've almost every time I've had these 
uh, experiences in these psychedelic uh, psychedelic journeys. That was always part of it. it at the, uh, I mean, I would learn all this much, but at the end of the light, there would always be there was the fact that, like I got to stop this. There's just some way somehow mm-hmm. I got to do this. A lot of times I tended to drop that, and I'm certainly was not doing it in a in a proper medical setting. As yeah, far as, like yeah. with the therapist on end. I would love to, like absolutely, and I look mm-hmm. forward to. Um, if it may be the day when I am able to do that, I do live in California. We are getting some progress made in that, going that direction. But yeah, I, I will say something that was crazy is not too long ago, I think probably about a month ago, uh, cause as I was going into the program and I wrote, I recognize that my step one, as far as the lack of integration with these huge experiences, um, I actually got the offer on a whim to go on a bit of a psychedelic retreat with my two best friends um, yeah. to go and do LSD. I've not, I haven't done ayahuasca. Uh, mm-hmm. I have done DMT in the past, but, uh, and so, yeah, I was like, totally dude. I never get this. Uh, I don't, I never get this opportunity. I'll take it. And um, a week leading into it, I was preparing, I was eating right, meditating, journaling, sort of setting the intentions, which is mm-hmm. so, cru- so crucial. I, did, I lacked a lot of that in, a big, uh, in the past. Yeah. And I remember there was a certain point where I was sitting at work and I was writing in my journal and I was thinking like, do I really want to do this? Like, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of scared. It's been a while. And I was like, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't do this. And then the very next, I swear, the very next thing, like a couple minutes later, I got a call from my brother in the fellowship and he called me and he just like poured out his own experiences. And like, he had just had a psychedelic trip the other night before. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, I, 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 and I kind of talking through him. I kind of just was just like gushing. And I was like, oh man, like, it's so cool. I'm so glad he shared this with me. Mm-hmm. Cause he, he heard me reference it in a meeting before. And then I got off the call and I was like, dude, what are the chances of that? Like, that's so crazy. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. <laughs> immediate that to me, that's some like higher power at work, like some synch- serious synchronicity. And then, uh, yeah, and I kind of used that and I was like, wow, well, I, I kind of, I'm going to go ahead and interpret that as a sign that uh, I should probably follow through with this. And yeah. I did, and it was huge. It was massive. It really, really showed me a lot, especially like being in this program and recognizing so much stuff in my life and my addiction. It really broke up in the mold, especially as far as my idea of a higher power and like spiritually. Mm-hmm. I'm not there yet at all. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. but I mean, yeah, it's been really profound in my life. And I, I look forward to as in the future, as I'm able to incorporate it more. Nice. Nice. Yeah. I don't think I've really talked about it on the podcast here before. So, you know, thank you for bringing that up. Um, one of my friends, she runs a recovery podcast and has had a number of guests talking about um, ayahuasca uh, in particular. And, you know, she and her husband are both have been in recovery for a long time for uh, drugs and alcohol. And so trying to thread the line of what's going to be safe for me uh, has been an interesting thing. And, but, you know, like you mentioned, it does work for some people. It may not work for others. And I think for myself, I am curious about it, but I, I think I'm just too chicken shit. I've never, never really experienced uh, any, any sort of drugs more than uh, marijuana. <laughs> so not sure if I'm ready to go there, but I have been talking with uh, a couple of my friends that have done uh, mushroom therapy and, and things like that. It sounds really really intriguing yeah man and uh, yeah and and that's totally fine too as far as that point like it's it really is it's not it's not for everybody and you know it's like everybody has different uh paths and different uh sort of callings i believe in life and uh yeah and that's like totally okay Mm -hmm. yeah for sure so back to sex addiction and something that you had mentioned earlier was around porn and porn piracy. What, <laughs> what are you talking about <laughs> with porn piracy? Uh, yeah, th- dude, this is interesting. Yeah. It, that's, it's always kind of like a complex thing to bring up in meetings, especially yeah. what it's like real quick. Like, and it's like my inner circle includes, uh, uh pornography piracy mm-hmm. like it's such a weird word like combination even yeah to say but yeah man at a certain point 
like as my addiction evolved uh, and grew stronger and stronger, and I've kind of delved into these different um, avenues at a certain point, probably when I was like 21 and I really started getting, I got my first job and I started making money. Yeah, I got into piracy and um, what that involves is a lot of like uh, file hosting, illegal file hosting, illegal gotcha. like gotcha. uploading, if people are not familiar with it. There's different like platforms. I'm trying to think of how this without going into too much detail. Yeah, files, and, uh, file sharing type of things or yeah and um so i first discovered it because i found like it was insatiable i couldn't there were certain niche things there were certain things i couldn't get my hands on just on the regular surface level websites mm -hmm. unless i wanted to dish out money and then i've been a tech kid for like years that was my main escape when i was a kid was the mm -hmm. home computer i'm really familiar with piracy and up to this point and I was like, oh, I never made that connection. This is like the logical route to go. And I eventually discovered a site and this site was a private site, meaning that it was invite only. Mm -hmm. um, and they usually do that because it, when it's illegal, you, you know, and just try to keep it pretty closed off. I kind of squeezed my way in there and eventually it just grew out of control. And I, man, I was just like, I fell into that pattern of just downloading and hoarding and hoarding, mm -hmm. and just like collecting. Mm -hmm. And it was like more content that I was, I would ever be able to watch. And yeah, that really made a spike in my addiction. That's where like really the hours would fly by, you know, d uh, day would turn to night and I was stuck inside staring at my computer screen, collecting all of this. Eventually I realized I uh, snooping around that there's even more exclusive sites. But in order to get access, again, these are private peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks and servers. And um, in order to get access to these sites, you would have to sort of prove your worthiness in a sense. Yeah, yeah. And uh, as an uploader, and I was like, well, that's weird. I guess I'll learn how to do that because I want, I want to get to that site. Eventually, I got into that. And what that meant is I was buying subscriptions to sites and I was going through and running code. Sometimes it wasn't that complex, but... I was going through and I was ripping the content to these sites and uploading them for all these people to download. And eventually I did that until I gained access to this site. But by the time I gained access to this site, which is like the most exclusive one, the most private one, I didn't stop. That was like my whole purpose of even beginning to do it in the first place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I realized at that point it was, it was addicting. I didn't realize then, but I realized at that point in hindsight, it, it became a whole new high in itself because the reality was it's like i was i was uploading a lot of this content and there was hundreds and thousands of people downloading these and like thanking me like praising me like oh man this is so so much work i, I appreciate you so much and it gave me a sense of validation like as, mm -hmm. as embarrassed I, as i might be to say it there was also this like sense of I was actually doing something productive with my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, and uh, especially around porn, like uh, kind of making that transference. It was nuts, man. And um, I probably a year went on just doing that until like eventually I was hundreds of dollars in debt. I was like, I think I at a certain point I pulled out a con consolidation loan and I had to pay some credit cards off and immediately I dumped it straight back into buying, paying to fuel this whole new avenue of uploading all of this. And I eventually got like some accolades as far as like the site and the representation in that site and the community there into like getting as a top uploader, but at the expense of so much damage in my life, it, it really came to the point of like, this is compulsive. Like I remember waking up in the first thing I would do is get on the computer and start that process uh, of uploading. And I remember I would look at my phone, I would look at the clock and I realized, oh shit, like four hours passed by. Mm -hmm. Like I need to get something to eat. I'm dehydrated. I'm like, my, my body aches from how long I've been sitting in this chair. I'm like, and then just immediately it's like, all right, just, just one more upload and then I'll get off. And then the next thing I knew, day was the night and the hours mm -hmm. had went by. And I was also just so totally isolating. And I like even going to the idea of going to a grocery store was terrifying to me. And the thing is, this community I was engaging with, this wasn't exclusive to me. This was like so, so common for all these other people who were on this site. 
And it was just sort of some people for some people share as they shared, it was just a, a reality they accepted like, oh, this is going to be my life from here on out. Like it's it's worth it. It's worth the, what I'm getting from the pornography. It's worth what I'm getting from this, mm -hmm. from acting out. That probably led me to one of my biggest lows is uh, this this uh, uploading to the site and this uh, just whole new avenue of a uh, high I was deriving from this. And um, God knows, I, I could tell you once I uh, I even got a letter uh, like uh, threatening me with legal action, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I was I was terrified. They they linked my account that I was pirating with to my real name, my real address, all my information. And I remember telling myself, I will never do this shit again. I will never do this shit again. Mm -hmm. And I fell right back into it. I think maybe a, a day or two went by and I was right back in. That pattern's re fallen into like all the times before where these extreme moments in my addiction and I've totally disregarded it and fell back into it, you know, mm -hmm. and there was probably in July or February earlier this year, I really hit an all time, all time low where I was just spending hours in this. I, like I had mentioned, I pulled out a consolidation loan to pay off all these cards and directly went back in. I was lying to family members about like, Hey, I need, can you please help me out? Like I need money for rent. Like I don't need money for groceries. Mm -hmm. I don't have anything to eat. And I would rationalize that by being like, well, that's the truth. I don't have money to eat and stuff, or I'm having all this, I have all this debt that I'm paying, but I wasn't telling them, oh, I have, this is all because I can't stop spending money on yeah. this pornography. <laughs> and um, that was a huge gr thing to come to grips with uh, coming into the program and sitting down with the sponsor. He was the one that revealed that to me. He was kind of like, uh, you're kind of BSing right now. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't may you may think that just because it's pornography and it's just you, you're not, all these other people are involved and you might not even re realize it. And there's more to that different avenues than that. But yeah, man. Um, and there's also the reality of like, I was damaging, I'll just say from my own perspective, I'm not anti porn. I'm mm -hmm. not, an I'm not anti sex workers. And, but the reality is there's, I wasn't, it wasn't just like these big corporations uh, surrounded in that industry I was affecting, but I really was affecting some of these people's livelihoods by uploading this. And I mean, there's probably thousands and thousands of dollars of damage in that process. And mm -hmm. um, that's another thing I'm, at first I was like, yeah, I guess so. But I've, over time, I've really realized that's a, that's, that's a reality. And there's also the reality that I was, I, playing a part in continuing a lot of people's addictions like giving a, sort of distributing this material yeah yeah but um yeah and that kind of led me to when i first got to the program probably in uh Feb february like i said it became like really unstoppable and um i mentioned earlier uh i've dealt with a lot of suicidal thoughts here and there growing up and that's sort of as I was like in extreme isolation, my brain was so dysfunctional from uh from all of that. Uh that sense of suicide that was started creeping up on me and I felt like it was going to catch me. And that was probably a, a big turning point for me when I uh started coming into the program, coming into what the tra trajectory of that. But uh yeah. That's a bit long winded. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <that's>, <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, it, it reminded me of a, a couple of things. Uh, number one was, and this is just minor, when we started first using uh, peer to peer software for downloading music, realized that we could download movies. And then I finally realized you can download porn. And I got into a lot of illegal stuff uh, via that. But um, we got busted for distribution of movies. So the Lord of the Rings Two Towers had just come out and Star Wars Episode Two had just come out. So this is right when I got into program back in 2002. And I remember downloading this stuff. And instead of taking it out of my share folder, I just left it in there. And so people were uploading from me. And uh, I got a, a similar note from the um, company saying, you know, linking our IP address and everything. 
and how scary that was for me and my, my wife. And then, you know, we did what we could and went back to downloading more music and stuff. <laughs> um, but the other, the other aspect of it, uh, before I got into program, my wife and I were building a, a porn website, you know, as I had, you know, a vast collection of, of online porn and we were designing something and instead of launching, I kept searching for more and more stuff and you know, kept downloading more and downloading more and, and never end up actually launching the website. We had logos, we had all this sort of stuff and, and it just never went anywhere because I was just so consumed with downloading more and more and more and just how crazy making that was. And I'm grateful now that we we never uh finished that but um yeah that was there was a lot of crazy making there so yeah dude i mean i myself i lost track at a certain point i've definitely uploaded more than a few terabytes of data oh geez. and i i used to have like the drives and uh, that's a funny thing now is like i have all this uh, now that i'm practicing abstinence and recovery i have all these drives with these terabytes on terabytes of data <laughs> like they're empty like mm -hmm. i i they have a bunch of music on it and stuff but mm -hmm. yeah yeah man i you know i i also have i have adhd too and mm -hmm. so I had gone to therapy for about a year and a half now. And God bless my therapist. She's she's amazing. She's helped me out so much. But my point being, I, I got prescribed Adderall after a certain point mm -hmm. for my uh, ADHD. And I didn't know that Adderall can boost uh, a lot of like... For some people, it can it can uh, it can kind of deter you know uh, sexual drive, but for some people, it could it could really take that up a notch. And that was mm -hmm. the case for me, especially around that time when I started uploading. I started getting into that process. It was very like I said, it was really like productive productivity. I felt like I was really getting a sense of like accomplishment from this, mm -hmm. thing. <laughs> and that was I went nuts with it, man. And uh, yeah, that was huge. <laughs> yeah. A couple of things I wanted to to touch on. One was you know going back to Native American culture, and wondering if you are watching any TV shows or, or things around Native American culture. My wife and I have been into a couple of different shows, and I'm so grateful that oh, yeah. the the representation is there, and it's no longer the the you know, the Indian chief with the, the, the feathers <laughs> and, and, and stuff that they're telling real stories and, and, and real, real uh, culture reservation oh, dogs oh, is yeah. an amazing show. I knew and, it immediately when you yeah. said it, I reservation dogs, um, dude, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's so interesting about it is it really keys us outsiders into the family culture and, the, the uh, multi-generations that, you know, hearing about the aunties and, and, and stuff, you know, I, I watched that. I watched Rutherford Falls, uh, uh, Dark Winds. Um, yeah. And uh, a lot of this, you know, they've got the, the writers, they've got the directors that they're sharing their stories instead of having a writer's room that has no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> and so it, it's been an eye-opening experience um, over the past couple of years, getting to hear those stories and the, the representation. And I was you know, just curious if you had uh, any experience watching those shows as well. And it sounds like you do. <laughs> Dude, yeah. If you can't see my face right now, I got a fast smile on my face. Like, I'm so excited you brought that up. Uh, yeah, dude. I remember as a kid, we, I mean, there was a few movies here and there, like Smoke Signals. Like, mm -hmm. we had those on uh, DVD and we would play those over and over again. But man, Reservation Dogs in particular, I really, God, I, Dude, I love that show so much. Uh, it makes me cry. <laughs> some, oh, some dude, every, yeah. every single episode. Yeah. I swear, I'm such a ball baby, like cry baby. Yeah. And I watch it with my family and just like, it's so beautiful. We cry together and it's like, but yeah, dude, I to just, it's so powerful and meaningful to get that representation of like mm -hmm. our, the family dynamic, the, the like the everything, the language of slang. It's like to a T with those writers in the room. Mm -hmm. And but I, also just that show encapsulates like intergenerational trauma so much as yeah. far as like especially with this new season and as it like mm -hmm. it's diving into 
the you know the, the ideas with this with the deaths and suicide and that kind of sort of how showing how the patterns uh can repeat mm -hmm. and um but yeah but i absolutely love that show it's phenomenal <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah my wife and i were just talking um about that you know we've got a, a, a i think tonight yeah there, there should be a new episode out so looking forward to that but yeah last last week's with the the psychedelic trip <laughs> was, uh something completely out of left field that i i didn't see coming but um yeah just i have been really digging that have you seen rutherford falls i haven't Okay, that one's on. Um, I think it's on Peacock, and I'm I'm kind of bummed that it didn't get renewed for a third season. But a lot of oh, the, the a lot of the same actors, about. yeah, a lot of the same actors are are on that as well. But yeah, that's another really really funny show. A couple of years ago, I um yeah you know, I I'm a huge fan of the HBO show Westworld. And they did an entire episode in Lakota uh, where there was, I think, very minimal English spoken. And it was just this beautiful, beautiful story. And it's uh, Zon McLaren, who's the police guy in Reservation Dogs. He was the, the main character in that. And him telling this, this love story and speaking nothing but Lakota. It was <laughs> just whoa it's amazing that you can have an entire hour without any english and we're you know reading subtitles and just being drawn into that story so i'm really grateful that some writers are are being represented now in the the writers rooms and and directors and actors as well yeah it's huge man i i've i've had a couple moments where it's like it's kind of weird because there. I mean, the reality is there's there is people who are like very rarely come into contact with somebody who's indigenous, who's native. Mm -hmm. I work at a healthcare facility, and so there's a lot of travelers. I've talked to somebody before, and they're like, "Wow, you're like one of the first native people I've met." And I was like, "Just the idea of that is so fucking bizarre, <laughs> yeah, so like <laughs> yeah. otherworldly to me." Yeah. But that's it's so amazing because a lot of the representation i know growing up was like a lot of it was independent a lot of indie stuff mm -hmm. you know stuff you could find on youtube and uh to see it on like a huge platform like mm -hmm. like hulu like hbo all these different uh, avenues and it's dude it's amazing it's so it's so so uh wholesome to see mm -hmm. and i think the last thing i wanted to mention was you talked about you know an outer circle um, around music and you know with my relation to to music and, and recovery and was wondering if you had uh, anything specific that you wanted to share or, or talk about in, in terms of that or how you relate to music yeah man I'm a very sensitive person I'm mm -hmm. very uh and like I mentioned I have ADHD and uh for the longest time I've, I've held a lot of shame in that and I've had a, it's, I felt like I wish I wasn't. In the past couple of years, I've come to terms with understanding how much that sensitivity and the ADHD and how much that's a blessing, how that's like really kind of tapped me into a lot of creativity as it does for a lot of people. So many of the like most creative people hold these traits of uh, the sensitivity of this uh, or being diagnosed with ADHD. And so music's been a huge outlet for me since I was a kid. I mean, mm -hmm. even just like starting out, just messing around, making beats on laptops with like a bootleg version of FL Studio, <laughs> and like mm -hmm. getting my first guitar and realizing like, oh, I cannot play this thing for the life of me and throwing it away for a couple of years and picking it back up. And, mm -hmm. But yeah, man, that's been a huge avenue, like creativity with me, for me. And it's kind of sad because, um, at a certain point as I got lost in my addiction and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of my outlets, especially creativity with music, I got, that got severed. I, I kind of like lost the motivation and interest. And a lot of that I kind of pinpoint to a lack of vulnerability. Like I was just trying to numb and that, trying to get rid of that sensitivity. And what's been cool is like uh, getting into recovery. I've rediscovered this like passion for music and this drive and just like, it's kind of weird for me to say, but mm -hmm. other people kind of relate to this is like, 
music's a huge outlet for me to connect with my higher power especially mm -hmm. especially like when i'm in the midst of recording a song and just like when i really connect and when i'm i don't know how to put it into words precisely but there's this connection with some that i feel is like a connection with god a connection mm -hmm. with something like a whole something bigger than me not to say that it sounds that good because it, it probably doesn't <laughs> but you know <laughs> that is real though that's a genuine yeah. feeling i get yeah i've i i'm a multi-instrumentalist play guitar bass drums piano throughout my life that's been like one huge outlet for me to sort of be able to express myself like a lot of people i have a trouble communicating a lot of the emotions a lot of the thoughts in my head these feelings but with music it's like i really feel like i am it that's one of the biggest ways i am able to get some stuff off my chest and sort of express some of the pain I carry as well as some of the joy, some of the like love I got. Mm. And, um, but, uh, sometimes it's not that deep. Sometimes I just want to pick up a guitar and strum around because mm -hmm. I'm bored. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, man. Yeah. And a lot of times I'll, you know, grab my guitar while I'm watching TV and just kind of mess around. Um, but other times when, you know, put the headphones on and start playing and I just get lost in it and just you know, really feel what I'm playing. It's just like, oh, this is, this is awesome. This is something that I've been needing for a while and picking up and, and connecting in that way is just a, an amazing thing. And one of the things I, I'm really enjoying right now, my, my 13 year old, he's been playing cello for a number of years and, uh, started picking up uh, one of my guitars and transferring his uh, finger ability into uh, playing playing guitar from cello to guitar is a little bit different, but um, he's learning Metallica songs and stuff. And it's like, oh, this is super cool. And I'm getting to give him some pointers here and there and whether or not he takes it, that's kind of up to him. But being able to connect through music the the two of us are, are really bonding and i'm getting to take him to a, a concert in uh, in a couple months and that that should be a, a really fun thing one of our friends his son plays drums in a death metal band and you know me and my friends and our kids got to go hang out multi so uh, my generation and then our kids we all got to go to the show and connect with each other through music and it was such a beautiful beautiful thing yeah that's sweet <laughs> that's Man. awesome so we are wrapping up we've been recording for about an hour here uh did you have anything else that you wanted to cover here before we close it out there was something oh i don't know the point to the music uh yeah yeah. Thing. yeah another point to the music um thing is you know, part of like what my sort of pathway, the tra trajectory that got me in SAA is um, there was an album by Kendrick Lamar and, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he just released recently where he had talked about his own sex addiction and his whole, the, embodied so much vulnerability in doing that. And dude, I can't tell you how many times I listened to that album. And there's like one song in particular, like there's a couple of amazing cuts on that album. like. There's track uh, Count Me Out, Father Time, a lot of those. There's a song called Mother Eye Sober that's, I swear to God, like whenever I'm feeling down in my program, I listen to that song and it never fails to make me cry. Mm. And that album was so huge in my trajectory into this program. And just like, especially that song really encompasses like so much of sort of what I was alluding to earlier about effects of generational trauma mm -hmm. and the manifestations in that and uh, specifically in sex addiction and sexual trauma and uh, abuse. And man, I, that, that was huge. And like, you know, that's just a testament to like how powerful music can be, man. And like the differences it can make. And uh, yeah, I actually saw him not too long ago. It was, I took my little brother to a concert. Speaking nice. of like that. It's a huge outer circle for me is concerts. I'm like obsessed. I'm addicted to concerts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, no, but like, yeah, it is phenomenal. It is phenomenal. Uh, yeah yeah i listened to that album uh it's been a while since i've listened to it but there's some intense shit on there dude totally yeah. totally and there was something else i wanted to add jason mm -hmm. 
uh, earlier to the point of me saying some of the difficulty in admitting I was a sex addict, you know, kind of that being reduced to uh, just being addicted to porn. I'm, I also identify with a lot of like intimacy avoidance and um, mm -hmm. yeah. or sexual anorexia. Uh, and a lot of there was also a lot of difficulty coming into the program because I, the truth is I've, I've never had sex. I, I am a, I'm a virgin. And I remember when I said that, when I presented my step one into our noon group meeting, and mm -hmm. I had never told anybody that, even my therapist, never told a single word. It's funny, I was joking with a brother on the phone. It's like, how, imagine that, like how weird, that's so weird to not tell anybody for years and years that being a secret, and then suddenly telling a hundred people in some Zoom meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I mean, yeah, man, there's, there's a lot of shame in it, a lot of like, I kind of a belief held that I'm less of a man because of that. And mm -hmm. even just saying I'm a sex addict, it's like, it was tough at first to come mm -hmm. to terms, uh, but realizing that like, that doesn't define me. And that, and that is part of why I'm here is to uh, mm -hmm. process some of that intimacy avoidance, you know, and um, just to realize when I was able to share that in that group, I remember more than a few brothers supporting me and saying, look, oh, you're, you're not alone. I came into the program in the same situation as you. Mm -hmm. So much of your story resonated with me. And I just, I also wanted to like bring that up on the podcast and hopefully yeah, uh, somebody listening, somebody else who's in a, a similar situation, you're, you're not alone. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, this program is often described as an intimacy disorder. And whether it's the in intimacy avoidance or the the various ways that we cope but it's it's that that intimacy that is uh, a fearful thing for quite a few of us so yeah i i know that you're you are not alone so i'm really grateful that you voice that here on the podcast and like like you mentioned you know sharing that with a hundred other people on a zoom meeting and now you're sharing it uh with the world here on the podcast so it's <laughs> it's an amazing amazing thing that you're doing yeah man it comes back to that point in the beginning it's like hopefully when we're able to communicate discuss these things mm -hmm. it dismantles the shame and the stigma you know yeah and that's powerful man that's good that's what we need yeah you know? exactly well i am so grateful that you reached out and wanted to share your story here and i'm grateful for this time because you know we've gotten to hang out and fellowship and stuff after the meeting but you know it's never been a one-on-one -on -one for for this long and you know i i feel like i know you a lot more than i did before and and i'm so grateful for that yeah thanks brother and i i appreciate all that you do i've told you before in fellowship mm -hmm. man this podcast is huge I can only imagine how much work goes on behind it and uh just just to say i really appreciate you and all that you do yeah thanks so much all right and i will be looking forward to seeing you tomorrow at the noon meeting for sure have a good night man i'll see you all tomorrow right. see ya I had such a wonderful time talking with Matt. We ended up chatting for about another 45 minutes after the recording. During our conversation, Matt mentioned the music of Kendrick Lamar, and I'll be playing a clip of that and also sharing my experience from High Lung's Ritual and their amazing ending song called Hammerer Hippier. But before getting to that, I did want to talk about the TV shows that Matt and I were talking about. First, really quickly, I wanted to touch on Rutherford Falls, which is the show that I mentioned that's on Peacock. And this is coming from the Wikipedia page. The series is a comedy about two lifelong friends, Nathan Rutherford, played by Ed Helms, and Reagan Wells, played by Jana Schmeeding, and Jana is also on Reservation Dogs. Anyway, their uh, relationship is tested when a crisis hits their fictional small town. After the mayor decides to move a statue of Nathan's ancestor, the town founder, because drivers keep hitting it, Nathan begins a quest to keep the statue in its place. Reagan has to juggle her loyalty to her friend and to her people, the fictional Minishanka Nation. She wants to develop a cultural center to highlight their history, and Rutherford's ancestor has become known for attacks on her people in the colonial era. So yeah, this is a really, really funny show, and it features a lot of indigenous people. And if you're looking for a good time, uh, there are two seasons of that on Peacock. 
Uh, the other show that we talked in depth about, uh, Reservation Dogs, is a show that was created by Sterling Harjo and Taika Waititi. And Taika's been really doing a lot lately. Like many of his shows and movies, they're culturally relevant, very funny, but also with a sense of heart. Again, coming from the Wikipedia page, the series follows the lives of four indigenous teenagers in rural Oklahoma as they spend their days committing crime and fighting it. After the death of their friend Daniel, one year prior to the events of the series, the gang wrestles with the desire to move to California the way Daniel dreamed of. But first, they need to tie up loose ends in their lives and community and make preparations to leave. And so, yeah, it is a comedy, but there is a lot about family, about relationships. Their friend Daniel uh, did commit suicide. So we had mentioned that in our conversation. And there are lots of other struggles that the, the people of this town go through. I did want to play a little clip of uh, one of the main characters, Bear. He runs into his spirit guide, and at this point, he's still called the Unknown Warrior, but his name is actually Spirit. And uh, this does have some offensive language here, but it's a really funny scene, yet it cuts to the heart of it, what a Spirit Guide needs to help bear with. Oh, young warrior. Looks as though you've tasted the white man's lead. It's only paintballs. I have had many brothers and sisters meet the same fate in my time. Are you crazy horse or sitting no 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 i'm not one of those awesome guys no i'm more of your uh i'm more of your unknown warrior yeah you know my name william knife man ah! 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 i was at the battle of little bighorn that's right i didn't kill anybody but i fought bravely well i didn't actually fight i actually didn't even get into the fight itself but I came over that hill real rugged like ah! Ah! i saw custer like that that yellow hair he was sitting there Son of the morning star, that guy right there. Fuck, I really hated him. So I went after him. But then the damn horse hit a gopher hole. Fucking rolled over and squashed me. I died there. This horse actually, a little shit. And now I'm meant to travel the spirit world. Find lost souls like you. The spirit world. It's cold. My nipples are always hard. I'm always hungry. Got it. Being a warrior, it's not always easy. You and your thuggy ass friends, what are you doing for your people? It's easy to be bad, but it's hard to be a warrior with dignity. Remember that. In my time, we gave everything. We died for our people. We died for our land. What are you gonna do? What are you gonna fight for? Ah! Ah, I'm just fucking with you. But for real though, listen to what I said. Marinate on that. Oh. Let's go. Ha! <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> it's played by Dallas Goldtooth. It just cracks me up. I found this show on Hulu. Uh, there are two seasons, and I know a third season is on its way. I think the end of the second season should be this week as I'm recording this. I also thought about playing a clip of one of the characters, Willie Jack, going to visit Daniel's mom, who's in prison. And Daniel's mom, Hokti, helps Willie Jack pray to the spirits. And this is one of those scenes that I talked about that brings just tears to my eyes. This episode came right before going to see Heilung. So talking about the spirit of the ancestors and then seeing the opening ceremony with the smudging and Native American women coming out really, yeah, it, it gave me goosebumps and uh, it was uh, emotional both watching the show and uh, being at Heilung's ritual. Uh, anyway, I really, really love this show and uh, you can tell that uh, Matt does too. Anyway, I did want to continue talking about the song that Matt talked about by Kendrick Lamar. That whole album is really, really intense. And listening to the song, I was trying to find a spot that I could take a sample from. And it was really, really hard choice. 
the, the beginning it's very low and slow but consistent uh, many lines in there and then he gets really really passionate and frantic and uh, as I'm recording this I'm not sure exactly which clip I'm going to play here but such an amazing song and this also features Beth Gibbons who is the singer from Portishead yeah and the song is called Mother I Sober I pray our children don't inherit me and feel inside track of conversation not being addressed in black families the devastation haunting generations and humanity they raped our mothers then they raped our sisters then they made us watch then made us rape each other psychotic torture between our lives we ain't recovered still living as victims in the public eyes who pledge allegiance every other brother has been compromised I know the secrets every other rapper sexually abused I see them daily burying their pain and chains and tattoos so listen close before you start to pass judgment on how we move learn how we cope whenever his uncle had to walk him from school his anger grows deep in misogyny this is post-traumatic black families and a side of me today is still active so i set free myself from all the guilt that i thought i made so i set free my mother all the hurt that she titled shame so i set free my cousin chaotic for my mother's pain i hope hakeem made you proud because you ain't die in vain so I set free the power of Whitney, may she heal us all. So I set free our children, make a karma, keep them with God. So I set free the hearts filled with hatred, keep our bodies sacred. As I set free all your abusers, this is transformation. somebody, anybody but myself. This album is absolutely amazing. Uh, some of it I found a little bit triggering and intense, uh, but yeah, really, really great. So grateful that Matt had mentioned that here during our recording. Wow. And going on to Heilung's ritual in San Francisco, I really, really don't know where to start. It was such an amazing performance and experience. I did get to hang with someone from the noon groups as well as my friend Bennett who was on episode 50 of the podcast and we had talked about the excitement of getting to see high lung and that we recorded that last summer and so yeah it was so intense at the beginning of the day I got to meet with some people that I met through Facebook for a lunch, a pre-ritual gathering, and we got to basically hang out and talk with you know just people that I've never met before, but we automatically knew each other. One of the the women that was in the group was in AA, and we started discussing recovery. And I actually mentioned this podcast and the program that I'm in, and it was such an amazing conversation. But yeah, we got to hang out throughout the rest of the evening. Before getting to the actual ritual, we also met afterwards, after the ritual was over at the same place, and got to hang out for a little bit longer. And I had the incredible fortune to meet one of the drummers from Heilung, as well as one of the Hari warriors. And just hanging out with them and having a conversation was just the topper on the evening. So yeah, incredibly grateful for that. But yeah, back to the experience. Yeah, I, I played the opening ceremony, which fed right into the song In My John. John, which I played a lot on episode 50 of the podcast when talking with Bennett. And yeah, Bennett didn't get to meet up with us for lunch, but uh, she ended up getting there just a few minutes before they took the stage. And I was fortunate to get there early enough that I was about six feet away from Maria Franz's microphone. Such an awesome spot, and Bennett actually found her way to the front and got to hang with us. But yeah, I did want to talk about the song Hammerier Hippier, 
and they close out all of their performances with this. And the, during the song, the native American women got to join them back up on stage. And this song is absolutely intense. And as Maria puts it, it's being a turbulent journey that is supposed to leave you relieved in the end because it can be super intense to listen to. But when you come out on the other side, you, it's, it's like this catharsis uh, process where you're like, okay, well, uh, all tension, all tension, and then uh, relief, and then you feel better. The song has a driving pulse throughout the entire song. It's over 10 minutes of intense drumming and lights and people all over the stage just moving moving and dancing the entire crowd got whipped up into a frenzy in the very beginning it's the the repetitive part is just hammer your hip 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 hammer your hip 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 it's very hypnotic and trance like I actually got into a mosh pit there. Uh, the uh, last couple of songs got everyone moving so much, a pit actually started, uh, and it was just incredible. The next section, which goes on for quite a while, is Hange Dira Minge, and that just repeats. And all of this is using the, the throat singing. It finally opens up to the vocal performance of multiple singers. The words here, and I'll read the translation, like bone sprain, so blood sprain, so joint sprain, bone to bone, blood to blood, limb to limb, as if they were mended. During the performance, there's a part of it where the Hari warriors crowd surf over the crowd in the front, and I got to hold up uh, three or four of them as they were passing overhead. Everyone on stage starts dancing in a circle, and this is where the Native American women came out, and where the crowd just got whipped into a frenzy, and I was part of that. And after a few minutes of just pulse-pounding beats, the voices from the rest of the vocalists comes back in and repeats the same chant as before from the Merseburg charm, blood to blood, bone to bone, etc. <laughs> And the voices finally give way as the beat drops away and we're just left with Christopher doing his throat singing. And something that I didn't add here, Kai adds really long and stretched out, Alu is Urki, 
which roughly translates to may it be of help. And oh my God, such catharsis after 11 to 12 minutes of this incredible drumming and intense music. Once it ends, I felt the negative vibrations and just the release of emotions. And it was such a fantastic evening. I also did want to clarify that this is my own experience. I meant to say that at the beginning of the episode, but you know, when I talk about the music that is touching me in a spiritual way, this is just my own experience. And I'm open to sharing all sorts of different experiences with different types of religions or non-religious pathways towards spirituality. Always happy to share it here on the podcast. One of the things I did also want to mention, the guy that organized the pre and post gatherings after the ritual, he wrote on Facebook something absolutely beautiful. And I wanted to read this. All of us bound through music, history, and ritual. I had never thought that it could be possible to top last year's ritual at Red Rocks, but for me, tonight went so far beyond anything I've ever experienced in my lifetime. A perfect example of the whole being greater than the sum of its parts. The barrier between performers and spectators seemed almost completely broken down as it was meant to be. All became participants. The energy was electric both on the stage and off. I, I completely agree. And some of the people that we were hanging out with actually got to hang out a little bit more backstage than, than we did and they got to hang out with the rest of the band and the, the warriors and all the singers and, and everything. The blue-haired warrior, Nadia, she mentioned to my friend that the San Francisco crowd was by far the most energetic crowd, and the entire crew absolutely loved feeding off of that energy. And I was just so grateful to be part of that. Like I, I mentioned, I'm still riding the high of that performance. Wow, I included so much in this episode. And as always, I'll be leaving links to these in the show notes, whether it's the Heilung performances or the Kendrick Lamar song and the clips from Reservation Dogs as well. If you do want to provide feedback for the podcast to be read here, you can reach us at feedback at sexaddictsrecoverypod.com. And if you want to be a guest on the podcast like Matt here, you can email me at Jason at sexaddictsrecoverypod.com and I'd be happy to get you into the schedule. I am not sure if I'm going to be doing an episode next week, maybe taking the, the week off for some time down. Um, but yeah, I really look forward to sharing another episode. I'm really grateful that you tuned into this one. And as always, keep coming back. The views and opinions contained in the Sex Addicts Recovery Podcast are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the Bay Area Intergroup or the ISO of SAA. SAA.